right? For some reason, me and this button don't get along. So welcome this morning. It is 8.30, and the Senate Public Health and Welfare Committee is now in call to order. We are going to have final action on bills previously heard. Jenna, are you with us today? Jenna Moyer? Yes, Mr. Okay. Chair, I'm here. Okay, all I could see was a little wizard guy, so I didn't know if he was the only one with us or or if that was your new avatar or I didn't know. So, <laughs> Jenna, I would like to first start off with working bill 238. Could you give us a refresher on what that bill is? Explanation, please. Yes, Mr. Chair, I'd be happy to. Um, this is Jenna Moyer, Advisor of Statutes. Um, thank you, um, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. Senate Bill 238 is the um, Behavioral Sciences Regulatory Board Bill that we heard on Wednesday. And um, this bill would reduce the hours required um, to provide the clinical social work supervision, as well as um, expanding out-of-state temporary practice permits, and would also add on that clinical supervision hours requirement that we heard about. Committee, do we have any questions that we need to have answered on Senate Bill 238 before we proceed? Okay, not seeing any. There were there was a little bit of confusion on the 900 hours and the 350 in-person hours um, during the committee hearing last Wednesday. Uh, David, Phi um, has some uh, clarification for that. So he'd, he'd like to give that explanation before we work the bill. Dave, welcome to the committee. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I am Dave Phi, Executive Director for the Behavioral Sciences Regulatory Board. And uh, I, at the meeting on Wednesday, uh, there was some confusion concerning the uh, testimony that was presented to you. I, I had discussed that within the 900 hours of practicum for the clinical license, um, the 350 hours could be part of those hours. And there was also some testimony presented by other people that said, no, it was more of a stacking on top of that. So after the meeting, you know, I really wanted to sit down with everybody and clarify for the committee so you'd have accurate information before making your decision. So I reached out to uh, Tanya Rickliffs with Washburn and uh, Kelly Jones with KU and Becky Fast with the Kansas chapter, the National Association of Social Workers, and also spoke to our uh, board member for one of the board members for social work, uh, Carolyn Zafrin, who was here attending the meeting and the assistant director for the agency. She's been with the agency for a little over 20 years, so she has some of the history of that. And I just wanted to clarify, so that is the uh, national accrediting body standard is the 900 hours. The Kansas statutes do call for the 350 hours of direct client contact. Now, nowhere in the Kansas statutes does it say that it has to be separate from the 900 hours. Um, However, in talking with the individuals who have the programs, they've indicated that when you have to include these 350 hours with the other items that are necessary for the practicum, it is the combination of those two which drives the hour total above the 900 to get to the 1200 that you hear. Um, however, some of those hours are included within the 900 hours. It's just from talking to each of the individuals, um, it sounds like not all of those 350 could be rolled in to effectively get every other item that needs to be included in the practicum. Um, so just wanted to clarify that for the committee. So as Kelly mentioned when she testified, it is kind of a complicated issue, but the, the, uh, the uh, information before you is that some of those hours can be included in the 900. Um, there's nothing that says they can't. It's just to fit everything else in. That's what drives the number up. And just to clarify, the number in statute right now is 350 direct client contact hours. The bill would drop that from 350 to 200 hours. Yes, committee, we will... Uh, Dave, you'll stand for questions, will you? Okay. Uh, Senator Gossage. Thank you so much for being here because I did walk away very confused, and so I appreciate that. So my understanding is that their concern is trying to make sure that they got a, a certain number of person-to-person -person hours in addition to their 900 because to them it felt like they had, um, you know, like especially some of the rural areas, they weren't going to get as many face-to-face -face and how much do you count? And I was 10 minutes here and 30 minutes there. Do you concur with that or what are your thoughts on that? So I think it's kind of a combination of factors. Um, you know, the board did hear about different um, 
uh, issues with a pandemic, some of them related to being person to person. And I think that's some of the reason why Senate Bill 238 includes the change in language for those clinical hours that they can be done now face to face instead of person to person. So some of that could be done over televideo. And then there's also the change in the bill that says under an emergent or extenuating circumstance that face to face requirement could be waived to allow for telephonic. So I think right now, currently in statute, I think that is that is an issue. Um, I think with the other changes in the bill, I think that does help uh, make those clinical hours a little bit easier. So I think the combination of reducing from 350 to 200 plus the changes and whether they can be done on televideo or over the phone should be helpful. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Quick follow-up. So all of these other folks that you talked to since our last meeting, are they now in concurrence with the 200 hours? Mr. Chairman, no, they have um, other um, positions, which which is fine. You know, I mean, we we are a public service agency, um, and we you know that's our number one priority is protection of the public. And so the the board and the advisory committee does value having a certain number of direct client contact hours. And if it's too high, that's why the board wanted to recommend to reduce it. Um, but in my conversations, you know, I, I believe the individuals who presented testimony, their positions are still that they would request for the ones who did. Some of them requested it that it be dropped to zero, and I believe that is still their position, and, and it's okay. We can have professional disagreements in terms of, you know, because they have different priorities than we do, um, but that, that's fine. So I just wanted to clarify, that as to my knowledge, none of their positions have changed from the testimony they provided. I just wanted to make sure you had accurate information before making your decisions. Thank you. Committee, do we have any further questions for Dave on this? Okay, seeing none. Dave, thank you very much for that clarification. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, committee, um, back on Senate Bill 238, um, what I'd like to do is, if we can, get a motion to pass it out, and then I know we do have some amendments, so then we'll open it up for discussion for amendments. So, do we have a motion? Senator Baumgartner. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I move, we, I make a motion we move. Motion and a second by Senator Petty. Um, we will now open for discussion on Senate Bill 238. Do we have any amendments? Senator O'Shea. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. I do have an amendment. Should be amendment number two. No? And do we want that to be emailed to the committee or go ahead and start with the Jenna, if you could just give a, or someone give a brief explanation, I believe most of it is just removing stuff, unless it's the telemedicine one. If it's the telemedicine one, we'd, we'd want it to make sure it's emailed. Right, this is the one. Um, so on page, it appears page 10, lines uh, 10 Mr. and 11. Chair, I can share my screen if that would help. Yeah, please do. Great. Yes, please. It'll take me just a second, and I sent this just send this out to Danola, so she should be able to um, send it out to everyone on the list. Sure. Okay, here we go. Right, so this is uh, this is Jenna Moyer Advisor Statutes Office. Um, I hope you can all see this. This is on page ten, and it would strike the clinical um, that three that two hundred hours of direct client contact supervision hours. We do have a motion on this by Senator O'Shea and a second by Senator Petty. Do we have any discussion on this amendment? Not seeing any, all those in favor say aye. aye. All those opposed, nay? Aye. Okay, that amendment is passed. Do we have any further amendments? Senator Holscher. Thank you, my apologies. I actually have the first amendment and was just kind of lost there for a second. <laughs> Um, this amendment is in regard to um, what we heard the other day during testimony uh, that was made in the House that addresses the issue in regard to clinical supervisors. Um, again, this is the same amendment that was made in the House that was also recommended here during the meeting. And Jenna, if you happen to have it that you can put on the screen, that would be great. great. Um, Mr. Chair, um, this should be that amendment striking um, those sections.
Just to clarify, that, that's removing section one, correct? <clears throat> what I can see? Um, Mr. Chair, this would remove sections one as well as nine. The section nine is about the fee related to um, the supervision requirement. And we, so we do have a motion by Senator Holscher and a second by Senator Petty for this, the Holscher Amendment. Do we have any discussion on this amendment before we take it to a vote? Senator Gossage, then Senator Stephan. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I guess my question is, why are we removing sections one and three? Is it one and three? Nine. Um, this is in regard to, um, let me pull up my note here to have uh, supervisor sign off. I don't know if you remember, we had a little bit of a discussion about that, and I believe I asked um, how many we have that are available. So as you might recall, that was changed in the House because of that issue. And I think uh, Becky, would you like to elaborate? This is a brand new mandate. This is one that only 17 states have. This would be that social workers who have their clinical license have passed two tests, have practiced under supervision for two years, and then um, have worked independently for two years as supervisors would have to become a state Kansas board approved supervisor. They would have to do an application process do a first time training and then every two years do a training. These trainings are very expensive. We don't even have it in Kansas. Um, and there's and we have very few clinical supervisors in the state. I think um, Dave said there's only 140. I mean, and we only have 80 who can even do it in Western Kansas. So um, the House amended it. We feel like this would delay the, as all the community mental health center said and child welfare, it's one more step clinicians will not want to supervise. And we already only have 35% of our workforce clinical, where all our neighboring states have 75% of their workforce is clinical. So all these regulatory hoops have really prevented us from growing our work workforce, this, these different steps of red tape. Becky, would you mind for those listening online, state your name? And oh, sorry, members. Becky Fass, um, NA, National Association of Social Workers, Executive Director, Kansas Chapter. Thank you. Um, I, I believe we had one from Senator Stephan, and then we'll have another Senator Baumgartner. Thank you. Uh, you know, where it sounded like originally this most of this was coming from the Board of Behavioral Science. Uh, is that who you're representing? Could you, can I have your comments on this? Mr. Chairman, this is Dave Fi with the Behavioral Sciences Regulatory Board. And yes, this was something where the, uh, the board did recommend to have a board approved clinical supervisors for social workers. Um, just a slight correction, when, when I spoke to the committee before, I indicated the board approves about 169 plans. We don't have a list of all of the social workers, but they have a six year window to get their um, clinical um, hours with their supervisor. Um, but um, yes, the board wanted to put this in because they viewed this as um, a good public protection um, and requiring continuing education hours so that supervisors would be aware of their responsibilities as a supervisor um, and be able to stay up to date in terms of best practices for supervision. And uh, right now, from what I have been told, you know, under the normal training to become a supervisor, there's, there's no, or to become a social worker, uh, there's no specific um, classroom education dedicated for supervision that I am aware of. Um, and so this would be a way to make sure that the people providing supervision are aware of what the standards are and keep up with best practices. Have you changed, has the board changed its stance on this in the last few days? No, the, the board is, is still in favor of this position, and, uh, and I provided some follow-up testimony for the committee. I believe you received it yesterday um, that just spoke a little bit more. Um, there was a survey that was done for clinical supervisors, clinical social workers back in 15, and that survey indicated um, that individuals providing those services were in favor of training and uh, being made aware, the supervisor being made aware of their responsibilities. Uh, so the board still believes this is a valuable part of the bill and would encourage it to stay in the bill. Senator Baumgartner. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair. My question is actually for you as well. Um, one of the things on page one is, um, is not subject of any disciplinary action of the board that would prohibit providing clinical su supervision. So if we were to strike this section, um, where else do we have um, that protection of them not currently um, not being subject of disciplinary action? Mr. Chairman, last year, uh, in August of 2020, the board changed licensing databases, and we have a method to track discipline against those individuals if they are providing supervision. So we have a way to track this, but we wanted to go ahead and clarify some of the requirements for these board-approved uh, supervisors. Becky, I have a question for you, if you wouldn't mind stepping up. During testimony, and I've, I've heard from some of the social workers in my district or around the state, that the workforce is hard to come across. Um, and something that we always have to be pursuing is a better outcome for our children in foster care. So in your, with your experience and in your opinion, by deleting this, would this help improve the workforce or would it hinder the workforce? Well, Southeast Community Health Center, they have, um, they have one supervisor who spends 20 hours a week to provide clinical supervision. Um, so they, it is, and so in like that four corner Southeast area, there's only like 15 clinical people that can even provide supervision. So if, you know, if even 10% say, I don't want to go through this whole nother hoop, you know, I've had my master's, I've gotten my clinical license, I've practiced two years, now I've got to have additional steps through the state of Kansas. Um, and when you said about that survey, if somebody sent you a survey and said you would like free training, you would say you want free training. It didn't say that you're going to have to go through all this regulatory processes and pay a fee and every two years pay, you know, and take this training. We have 40 hours of continuing ed. Um, and like a lot of the colleges do offer that supervision training that he's talking about through their masters. Um, so they ready get that coursework. Um, I will say that I've talked to a number of social workers. If this comes through, they will not supervise. They do it out of the goodness of their heart. And it's a, and you're taking people under your, the liability of your license. And if they leave your agency, you have to follow them. So if they leave KBC, then you have to follow them to St. Francis. So you're liable for them. And by making this a state mandate, this is you know even more liability that they're taking on. Um, I'm a clinical social worker. I wouldn't do it in Kansas. I would do it in Missouri um, because of this mandate. Um, or Oklahoma doesn't, you know. I mean, Oklahoma Licensing Board provides free training for their workers. That's what I've asked for BSRB. Let's provide free training. Why make, you know, the community mental health centers, child welfare agencies will have to pay for this training. Um, it will, you know, it will just go down the line, which means the state of Kansas is paying for it because it's not, it's not cheap training um, because um, it's very difficult and expensive because social workers don't want to provide the training because it, they feel like they're liable. If I train you to be a state approved board mandated supervisor. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, they've, like I said, most social workers have passed three competency tests and we only have about 20 um, disciplinary actions for the last 10 years, it's averaged about 20 on our licensed clinical social workers. So I don't see the issue of compensation in our workforce. Becky, thank you. Uh, committee, do we have any further questions on this amendment? Um, Dave, do you want a comment? Mr. Chairman, I just wanted to clarify uh, two points. Um, one, in terms of the lack of availability of supervisors within the bill, there are changes specifically for supervision. And so it no longer needs to be 
person to person in person. So, you know, if you had distances that could have created a barrier in the past, if that provision is passed in Senate Bill 238, supervision could be done from greater distances remotely. So that is one issue to that point. I just wanted the board to be aware of. Um, and then the second point in terms of the price and the cost of these continuing education hours for social workers, there are 40 hours every year that social workers must receive or every two years for their continuing education requirements. And these would not be on top of those. They could fit these continuing education requirements within the 40. It would just be in place of other hours they might normally receive. Thank you, Dave, for that clarification. Okay, we are now back on the Holscher Amendment. We do have a motion and a second. Seeing no further discussion, all those in favor say aye. Opposed, nay. That amendment is passed. Do we have any further amendments? Senator Erickson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yes, I do have an amendment. It was referred to as amendment number three, um, the House version, and this is the telemedicine amendment. So I'll, Jen, if you have that available. If it's just a second, why Don Nola was emailing that out? And I've sent it to Donola. Jenna, I do believe everybody has received it. I heard some dings going off at the same time I received mine. So if you want to go ahead and explain the amendment. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Jen Weyer, Revisor Statutes Office. This um, language is adopted from House Bill 2066, which came from a Commerce Committee. Um, just It was a licensure bill in general. And this is a telemedicine provision, allowing physicians to practice telemedicine and allowing a special waiver for um, out-of-state physicians to practice telemedicine. Senator Erickson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yes, what this does is it basically codifies what was passed during special session last year in SB 14 and the governor's executive order last March, um, which basically gives access to people through telemedicine. And um, I want to assure the committee that this um, has safeguards in it to the point that the Physician applying for the waiver to the Board of Healing Arts has to be in good standing and licensed in their home state. They have to meet the requirements of our state Board of Healing Arts. And I especially want to call your attention to um, letter H, which says nothing in this section shall be construed to prohibit a licensing agency from denying an application for a waiver under this section if the licensing body, which is our Board of, of Healing Arts, determines that granting the application may endanger the health and safety of the public. And in my experience with telemedicine, it's provided affordable, accessible care for those, um, you know, everyday issues. We don't want anyone practicing outside their scope. We've got the safeguards in here. But my experience is this isn't just a COVID-19 accessibility and affordability issue. It extends beyond that. And so we've had this in practice since last spring. It seems to be helping Kansans get access to the health care that they need. And so um, I think we need to make this a permanent option uh, for Kansans. So thank you, Mr. Chair. I move my amendment. We have a motion on the amendment. A second by... Okay, a second by Petty, Senator Petty. Point of order situation. Discussion. Um, Senator Stephan, after we have the second, that's when we open it up for discussion. So we, to go back, just to clarify, we do have a motion by Senator Erickson and a, sen a second by Senator Petty for the Erickson Amendment. We are now on discussion. Senator Stephan, do, I, do you want to comment on it? I, I think we should have the discussion that 
SB 238 deals with professional counselors, social workers, marriage and family therapists, addiction counselors, and master level psychologists. Number one, it does not address physicians at any point in the text. <clears throat> it re refers to the Board of Behavioral Science only. At no point does it refer to the Board of Healing Arts, and not at any point. And fifth, it does not refer, SB 238 does not refer to telemedicine at any point in the text. And that's what this amendment, the main topic within that, this amendment is telemedicine. I put forth that this is not a germane amendment to SB 238. All right, so you're challenging the germaneness of the spill? Okay. Give me just a second, let me look. Mr. Chair, if you had a question about the procedure, I can clarify. Sure, Jenna, go ahead. Okay, uh, Jenna Moore, Revisor, Statutes Office. And although germaneness is a requirement on the floor of the House in general orders, in committee amendments, um, chairs are given a lot more latitude. And so it will be up to the decision of the chair um, if he were to um, allow this or not, whether he finds it in order. The only requirement that you have um, is a constitutional requirement of a single subject. And um, in this instance, if this amendment were to be adopted, like it was in the House, um, it would just be an act concerning health professions and practices. So it would just broaden um, the scope beyond behavioral sciences to just those health professions and practices in general. Thank you, Jenna. Um, Jenna, do you know if the question of germaneness came up in the House? Uh, Mr. Chair, I do not remember the discussion, uh, a challenge of, or a, a question about germaneness when this was um, amended in the House. Because this bill does um, fit into the single subject rule, we want to rule that it is germane. So we are now back up for discussion. Do we have any further discussion? Senator Stephan. Thank you, Chairman. I do want to point out that the that this this does follow what was in the Kema bill, but the Kema bill specifically the telemedicine rule specifically referred to an emergency act. This strips away the emergency act component of it and makes it twenty four seven three sixty five, which is a dramatic dramatic change for telemedicine and which should be handled in a separate bill with the opportunity for the stakeholders to come and weigh in on it. You know, I'm from, from rural Kansas, and I've talked to many, many family practice physicians, and they, to a person, find this very, very threatening to the viability of their practice. <clears throat> it takes patient visits away from rural primary care physicians and nurse practitioners. It uh, erodes the, the, the continuity of the care, the, the, the security of the practice. It, it fractionates the care of the individual patient. <clears throat> and this is not the way to institute free run telemedicine by un-Kansas licensed physicians in the state of Kansas. This is not the place to do it. And I would be very grateful if you would understand the ramifications of this amendment and, and not put it into an otherwise reasonable bill being fostered by the Board of Behavioral Sciences. This, is, this amendment is not being promoted by the Board of Healing Arts. It's not being promoted by the Kansas Medical Society or the Osteopath Society. It's, it's, it's coming in, it's being ran by a lobbyist of a company <clears throat> that does telemedicine. That's where this, this amendment came from. That is not how we want to, to enact telemedicine permanently in the state of Kansas. Thank you. Senator Petty. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, 
One of the things that we've uh, found out this, um, you know, last year uh, with uh, the pandemic and, and as was referred to earlier with the governor's executive order and the actions of the legislature when it comes to telemedicine, that prior to that, um, we were very cautiously moving along with uh, opening up uh, telemedicine's use across the state of Kansas. And um, just like within our educational uh, arena, we found, uh, the providers found that it was a valuable tool and has been extremely uh, effective and um, is meeting those needs. I will say I have not heard from practicing physicians that this is challenging or threatening their, their practice. I think it's enhancing what I found from my own, say, primary care doctor is that it's another tool for them to use to provide services and not um, threaten them. I mean, there are some other things that come into play when it comes to um, covering costs, but that's not included in this particular provision. provision. But I think this does uh, open, remain open that door to provide telemedicine in all areas for when it comes to physicians across the state of Kansas, and I think it's a good amendment. Senator Erickson, this is your amendment. Would you like to comment? Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. I think we need to be very clear about what this amendment does and does not do. First of all, it does not amend the Telemedicine Act at all. It simply clarifies the licensing procedure for those out-of-state doctors that want to do that with oversight from our Board of Healing Arts. It's also my understanding that the Board of Healing Arts does not um, oppose this amendment. So if that's not the case, then I would like um, clarification on that. But it's my understanding they do not, and it does not amend the Telemedicine Act. So just dealing with the licensing. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Senator Gossage. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, may I ask a question of Senator Stephan? You may. He doesn't have to respond. Though. Okay. <laughs> Senator Stephan, if you will. I started to say stand for question, but sit for question. Um, it's my understanding from some of my physician friends that they could, they themselves could offer telemedicine. Is, do you understand that that way? Yeah, and that's, a, that's the exact point I would, was wanting to make, is that within our communities, our small communities, the, the, the clinicians are developing the means by which they can provide telemedicine. And, and then it is an adjunct to, to good quality care overseen by a primary care provider. This opens up that an un-Kansas licensed physician who doesn't reside in the state of Kansas can sit out anywhere in the country and poach patients and patient patient visits. That's the best way to look at it. Poach patient visits away. No, this is we we are letting this. We should let this develop. This is a, a rapid step forward, and we don't have the Board of Healing Arts here to tell us what they think. And that that we don't want to assume. On a, on a bill this big. So yeah, what the, the right way to do this is to give the local providers the time to develop the telemedicine capability so they can see a patient quickly in two dimensional, to two dimensions, decide whether they need to see them in three dimensions or go ahead and treat. That provides continuity of care, that promotes our Kansas providers and, and solves all the problems. This bill doesn't do that. Senator Holscher. Yes, I see that Kyle Kessler is here. I'm wondering if we might call upon him to expound upon this question. I think we could call on him, but I'm not too sure he's the one that will answer that. Thank you, Kyle. Senator Baumgartner. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I think that one of my concerns is you're right. We have had, we are in a pandemic 
and we did have an executive order. We also have Kima, and we opened some things up, but we certainly haven't received any type of reporting. There is no data that I have seen that documents what has and hasn't worked. Um, with regard to even student distance learning um, or telemedicine, we just haven't received any data on that. Um, to say that, well, we passed it, we're in the midst of a pandemic, so there's that temporary um, window of opportunity that, that still does not provide us with any data um, to be a basis to turn it into law. And I guess um, I was revisiting um, the testimony that we received on this particular bill. And there is some anecdotal comments. In fact, even Mr. Kessler mentions, you know, telemedicine, but not with the basis of any data to go by. Um, I would like to have, we've brought up different groups and organizations. They're not here to testify about this. And I understand this is modeled after something that the House did. Um, I see passing this bill out of committee without this amendment will still take us to conference on that issue, um, which perhaps would give us an opportunity to get some additional information. I don't know that we're ready for this. Um, because I, I just don't see that we have information about making it codified into, into law. Senator Petty. I will just add that this also was an item, and I would probably agree with Senator uh, Baumgartner that uh, we don't have a lot of data, but it also was an item that was very high in priority with the mental health uh, reform, I mean, modernization reform uh, commission that met over the interim. Jenna, just a quick question and a quick clarification on the amendment. I, I've read it a couple of times while lis also listening to debate. I know some of you guys will find it hard to believe that I can multitask. But um, I just want to make sure since my multitasking skills are subject at times, there is nothing in here, and this, this is just for clarification, that says there has to be parity or that it is a covered um, for Medicaid or um, health insurance plans mandatory. I just want to clarify that. If you could, please. Yes, Mr. Chair. Jenna Moyer, Advisor Sedgwick's Office. There is nothing in this amendment um, that addresses the issue of billing or payment. So that would be, however, their, the insurance companies that are currently doing it would likely be how it would continue. And there's no parity in it as well? Um, no, not that. No, there's nothing related to that in here. Okay, thank you. Senator Thompson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, you know, I want to concur actually with uh, Senator Staff and Senator Baumgartner. Uh, you, um, Certainly telemedicine, I think, has a future, and we're heading that direction. But um, with this emergency over the last year or so, it seems there are a number of items that we are rushing headlong into without proper deliberation and consideration. This may be one, and I, I concur with Senator Stephan that there's a time and a place for it, but perhaps this bill is not it. And uh, so I would not be supportive of this amendment. Do we have any further discussion or questions on Senator Stephan? Thank you, Chairman. I just, just follow up on the reference in this amendment that it says physician. I think it's important that this is not medicine. Committee members, do I have any further questions? Senator Erickson. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair. And, and I do appreciate the concerns that have been raised about the timeliness of this bill. Um, it has been a year that we have had this in practice. And, and what I continually hear, and I appreciate um, the comparison to education because that's the world I lived in. So let, um, let me give you just a little bit of information about what telemedicine means to education. Because I was a principal in a district that provided telemedicine for my staff. Prior to that being a part of our health plan, here's what would happen. Every day about a third of my staff would be absent for illness. That is a huge cost to pay substitute teachers to come in. When we put telemedicine into our school district plan, now my teachers could get up at 7 o'clock, have a doctor on the phone, get what they needed, be at school, because teachers don't want to not be with their kids at school. They want to be there. The district policy was... If a teacher had to miss any part of a day, it had to be at last at least half a day. So they couldn't just go to the doctor for an hour and then go to work. It was half a day they were charged for leave. Telemedicine provided them that opportunity to be in school with their kids, benefiting them because they didn't have to take half a day of pay off. And they were there with their kids, which is better for any kid to have their regular classroom teacher than a substitute. Secondly, I keep hearing about all the talk about how the impact on physicians, the impact on, and I'm not trying to minimize that at all, but what about the Kansans that for a year have had access? And I don't know if anyone who, myself included, I used telehealth medicine when I was a principal. I didn't want to be out of my building for at least half a day for something I know is a chronic issue, chronic, chronic, chronic sinus infections or ear infection. I could be in my building doing my job. If whatever the telehealth doctor prescribed to me wasn't effective, I didn't go back to telemedicine. I went, okay, this isn't working. Something else is going on. I need to make an appointment with my physician. So I think what, the, what I'm not hearing is a discussion about the practical implications of removing access that, that Kansans have had during a pandemic and going forward with the priority being accessibility to adequate, reasonable health care for Kansans. Also part of this um, amendment deals with physicians being able to consult with other physicians across the country, being able to consult with those at Mayo Clinic and having that ability to do so. so um, I would just urge us as we deliberate, I, I am not minimizing the um, concerns being brought forward, but weigh that against the benefits to Kansans and their access to those routine um, issues that we have and uh, the availability on weekends and evenings to have access to the, this care. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Senator Stephan. <clears throat> And again, I think we've we've covered all those scenarios in our discussion already. You know, what this bill does is it preferentially gives an advantage to these out-of-state physicians who aren't, don't live here, don't work here, aren't licensed here. And, and again, we are ramping up our local doctors to provide that telemedicine. Who better could respond to those needs within the school than the local health care providers via telemedicine? Who could do better than that? And, and, and again, the one year, it's been one year. One year is not very long. <clears throat> you can't conduct studies as to the efficacy of, of this kind of treatment in one year. It takes the compila compilation of data over a far longer period of time than that. So again, <clears throat> I, I appreciate the emotional plea. And, and the other, other aspect of that was who in this room thinks teleeducation is better than in-person education? Senator Baumgartner. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I re appreciate the comments of the carrier of the amendment. I will just simply draw a line of, of 
differentiation because earlier in this committee, um, we had a bill with regard to audiologists and speech pathologists, and it was a compact bill. And it's an agreement where um, individuals that are licensed in that profession um, through the compact will be able to participate um, and, and deliver services, uh, medical care, um, via tel telemedicine. Uh, but again, that, that compact is what I see as a control device because they will have a single system that will allow all of the participating states to verify um, whether there is any type of conduct that would be inappropriate for that person to practice. And it is established so that there is consistency. I don't see that with this. Um, I would be more comfortable if we were looking at um, a compact for physicians so that we weren't, um, so that we had that assurance of consistency with regard to individuals that might have um, pending issues with, with their governing state boards. Um, I see that as a, a difference, um, similar but different because it doesn't have the power of a compact that helps to regulate and oversee. Um, and I don't think that we really have a sense right now within our state um, how that executive order and how what was then legislated through KEMA, how that really has played out. We don't, I don't think we have a, a sense in any manner. I've not seen it reported from insurance um, companies, from our Department of Insurance. I've not seen it in any way, just what that out-of-state participation has been. Certainly, we want the availability of care, but that collegiality and consulting outside of state with experts, be it in Missouri, um, be it at uh, any other um, nationally renowned medical institutions, that can occur at any time, physician to physician. But we're talking about physician with patient, Mr. Chair. Senator Gossage. I appreciate this discussion and thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, being in the insurance world like I am, what I have seen is telemedicine's been around a lot longer than just one year. Um, in fact, if you were to do a quick Google search, you'll see telemedicine, how to have an online visit, Mayo Clinic. You'll see the Amer American Medical Association, ASN, how telemedicine is working. And then you see Johns Hopkins University, benefits of telemedicine. I'm, I don't know of a single insurance company now that doesn't cover telemedicine, including Medicare and Medicare Advantage plans. They have been very successful, so I just wanted to clarify that as part of this discussion. Senator Thompson. I just have a question. I, can't telemedicine go forward in the free market without us creating a bill? to do so? I, I, I guess I'm not understanding something here because I, 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 to Senator's point, um, there has been telemedicine. Um, and I think if there were to become a telemedicine bill, I would be much more comfortable because then, I, then we would be on a single topic and, and could deliberate on that better. I'm not against telemedicine by any stretch of the imagination, but I think it should be done in in a single consideration rather than piggybacking on another bill. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Mr. Chair, I might be able to provide some clarification. Oh, please do. Okay, um, this is January Advisor Statutes Office. And um, I'll first clarify, the um, there is an interstate medical licensure compact for physicians. And so a physician would, from out of state, um, could be part of this compact and get licensed in the state um, and their ability to practice telemedicine. So if you were, you, you know, you're located in Nebraska, but you have a part of this compact to be licensed here, there's a restriction in the telemedicine bill that was passed in 2018 
um, that would prohibit that doctor who may have this be part of this compact from doing telemedicine without being in the actual physical state. And so that's the restriction that this would um, that this amendment would eliminate would be that ability even if you had you do a licensure to practice um, from out of state. And I hope that answers the Senator Thompson's question. I see a lot of heads shaking in agreement. So thank you very much, Jenna. Any further discussion or questions on this before we take it to a vote? Senator Baumgartner. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So this is a question for Jenna. So this is a really essentially amending the telemedicine or amending the physician compact bill. Is that correct? Is that what this would by fiat be doing? Um, Mr. Chair, General Meyer, Advisor Statutes, um, I wouldn't say that this would amend the um, interstate, let's see, it's 65-28-133, the Interstate Medical Licensure Compact, but if a, I don't, I mean, it doesn't change the text of that, but if a physician were part of that compact and wanted to practice telemedicine, it would eliminate a barrier to do so. Mr. Chair, I appreciate that clarification, and I'm just wondering if the carrier of this amendment would be agreeable to adding that they would, the physician would need to be a participant in the compact. I think that gives us that assurance, doesn't it? Senator Erickson. Mr. Chair. Yes, Eileen. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Eileen, my, uh, Office of Provisor of Statutes. It's not the actual physician who is a member of the compact. It's a compact state. So the state has to be a member state of the compact. And as the if the member state has signed on to the compact, then there's an expedited path to essentially reciprocity and, and state licensure um, where Kansas would re recognize that the other state has provided the, you know, documents, the criminal history check, the all of those, the education check, the those background documents and such to um, our state and kind of smooth out that path to licensure so it's much faster. Um, I think this amendment to the bill would provide a different path to licensure in the state, but it would not amend the compact. Senator Baumgartner, would you like to follow up on that? Well, yes. Um, then I guess the question would be, do we want to make the parameters? Would the carrier of this amendment be willing to put the parameters that it would be for physicians that are um, compact members? Physicians from a state that are compact members. Senator Erickson. Okay. Um, yeah, because after the clarification from the reviser, I guess with it being a state compact, not an individual compact, um, I'm not familiar with the details of that at, at this point. Um, Mr. Chair? Uh, yes, Eileen, go ahead. Sorry, I, I apologize for jumping in like this. It's not normally something that I would do. Um, but I guess my question would be, it's twofold. Would you want to provide the path using the Interstate Medical Licensure Compact for individuals from a compact state and provide this other path for individuals who are not from a compact state or only provide the one path using the interstate medical licensure compact? Senator Baumgartner. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm actually more comfortable with it, a physician from a compact state because that does give us that um, information with regard to background checks. Senator Stephan. Thank you, Chairman. I think this discussion is clearly ballooning and proving that this needs to be handled separately. This doesn't belong in this bill as an amendment. 
we did not come in here today prepared to have the kind of end up discussion it takes to, to solve this problem. So we, we have a group of states that are in a compact that have some reciprocal uh, interaction to ensure safety and, 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 and such via telemedicine. And, and so we've already have that opportunity is in place. We don't need this amendment. If we, if we convert the amendment to Senator Baumgartner's suggestion, then we just have the same language that's in, that's already existing. It would become redundant. So again, yeah, I don't, I don't mean to speak for you, but again, this is not the time, this is not the place, this is not the bill to tack on something as complicated as this. This needs more time, it needs more experts, it needs more opportunity to, for people on the ground floor. It's the doctors in my area, they don't know this is coming, coming at them until I talk to them. And then all of a sudden, they're, holy smokes, I can't believe this is going on. We're, we're providing telemedicine, we're working to develop telemedicine. <clears throat> it's just not needed. It's not the time. It's not the place. We're down a rabbit hole. We're not going to get out of successfully. Mr. Chair. Yes, Eileen. Sorry, Eileen, my Office of Supervisor of Statutes. Just one point of clarification. Uh, the Interstate Medical Licensure Compact is not solely for the purpose of telemedicine. It is for physicians to be licensed in more than one state. It's for a physician who may spend winters in Florida and summers in Michigan. It may be for physicians who, you know, are, are married to armed forces members who may, you know, not yet be under the Armed Forces Act where they can you know, have reciprocity in all, in all 50 states. It's, it's, it's not just for telemedicine. Senator Baumgartner, your name was mentioned in that last comment. Do you want to respond? I only, I, I thought that Jenna indicated that telemedicine wasn't a part of the compact language. Um, and so to me, this would um, open that up or telemedicine, I just felt more comfortable that it be with participating compact states. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Senator Erickson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I think um, the discussion brings to point that it is the time that we've had this compact. Kansas has had this compact. It hasn't been to the detriment of Kansas physicians. We've had that reciprocity. The problem with the compact is it does not specifically deal with telemedicine. To me, it is the time for this. Section 2 provides all of those safeguards that are being brought up. If the Board of Healing Arts determines that this is a detriment, they don't have to give a waiver to somebody. Again, my priority is getting timely, accessible, affordable care to Kansans. We do have the safeguards built into this. Reciprocity exists. It has not been to the detriment or done away with rural health care. And so, again, I think that proves the point. It is the time. This is the bill. This is, this is the vehicle for this. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Do we have any further discussion or comments on this before we move it to a vote? Senator Stephan. Thank you, Chairman. seen studies on the effect of reciprocity and telemedicine on healthcare delivery in Kansas. Have we studied it? I haven't seen it. Senator Erickson. Thank you, Mr. Chair, since that question was directed exactly at me. Um, to that point, we could, on that logic, delay and not work anything in this legislature. If we had to study things for multiple years and have every stakeholder, we would never accomplish the work of the people. They sent us here to represent them. And that's what we're doing. Is it ideal? Would we love to have all the time in the world to, to study every issue to the nth degree? Absolutely. It's not realistic. And so I think the, the safeguards are in there. If we need to, 
to go back at some point and look at it, but let's give access to Kansans. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Do we have any further questions? Not seeing any. We will now uh, take a vote on the Erickson Amendment. All those in favor say aye. aye. All those opposed, no. The ayes have it. We will now move on. Do we have any other further um, amendments or Mr. discussion? Can I get clarification? Uh, um, sure, okay. Jenna. Yeah, the issue of amending the amendment, or excuse me, Jenna Wire Revisor Statutes Office, um, the issue of amending the amendment to restrict to members of compact states was mentioned, and I just want to clarify whether that was actually part of the amendment that was just passed or not. Because there wasn't a specific motion or um, to actually adopt that change of language or that restriction. And so before I write the report, I want to make sure that I have that correct. No, that was not part of that um, amendment. Senator Baumgartner. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I would concur. It was not a part of um, the motion for the amendment. Um, I will be working with research and with the reviser to come up with that Is it to the floor thank you mr chair thank you senator baumgartner and we will definitely um, take that up and on the floor so we won't have any conflicts with debating that senator gossage thank you mr chair i know that we are running out of time and i would move that we take the contents of senate bill number 138 and roll them into 238 we have a motion by Senator Gossage to take the contents from Senate Bill 138 and insert it into Senate Bill 238. Do we have a second? I have a second by Senator Erickson. Do we have any discussion on this motion before we take it to a vote? Senator Petty. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I actually have an amendment for Senate Bill. Okay. If after we take care of this motion, we'll take up your amendment. No further discussion. All those in favor, say aye. aye. Those opposed, same or nay. The ayes have it. That motion's carried. Okay. Uh, do we have any further amendments, Senator Petty? Mr. Chairman, Jenna. Senate Bill 138. Yes, Senator, I will pull that up. Give me just a second. She's doing that. I'll just, if it's okay with the chairman, I'll just speak to this. Um, I, this is a really important bill. Uh, I'm very supportive of it, but I think we did hear about change in the implementation date uh, that did occur on the House side. Um, there's, they made it May of 2022. Uh, the amendment that I offer is making it from July 1 of 2021, which is not really an achievable date, to uh, January of 2022. We have a motion by Senator Petty. For amendment and a second by Senator Gossage. Do we have any discussion or questions on this amendment? Not seeing any. All those in favor say aye. aye. Those opposed, nay. The ayes have it. Do we have any further amendments for Senate Bill 238? Under petition to pass out the 238 as amendment, as amended. Now we want, it's actually a substitute for Senate 238, isn't it, as amended? Um, no, I still believe, would it be Senate substitute? Would we do a Senate oh. substitute for it? Yeah, thank you, Jenna. Mr. Chair. Jenna Moyer, Reviser Statutes Office. And there was not a motion made to make it a substitute bill. The committee could if they wanted to, so that it wouldn't show markup. But at this point, um, it has not been made, and there's no preference from our office, which we which approach you take. Okay, I'm going to make a motion to offer up. A, 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 to pass out substitute for Senate Bill 
238, favorable for passage. We have a motion by Senator Petty to pass out a substitute for Senate Bill 238, favorably for passage, and a second by Senator Gossage. Do we have any discussion on or questions on this motion before we take it to a vote? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. aye. Those opposed, nay. The ayes have it. Senate Bill, substitute for Senate Bill 238 will now go to the floor. The last bill that we have that uh, would like to work would be Senate Bill 12. Jenna, could you give the committee a overview, refresher on Senate Bill 12, please? Thank you, Mr. Chair. I will be happy to. Um, Jenna Moy, Revisor Statutes Office. And Senate Bill 12, we heard it a few weeks ago, and um, it relates to requiring the Department for Children and Families to implement those performance-based contracts. And that would be tying the um, implementation or signing of contracts related to the actual provision of services and whether or not those contractors have provided those um, performance measures. Mary, do we have any questions on the overview? Seeing none, what is the pleasure of the committee? Uh, Senator Baumgartner. Mr. Chair, um, I would tell you one of the concerns that I have with this bill is, um, is that if you look at the testimony that we did receive from DCF, they don't actually enter into contracts with these organizations. Um, they enter, there are grants, um, and there was not an indication from the agency that they would change the process of offering grants to contracts. And so, while I certainly appreciate this legislation brought to us by our colleague, um, Senator Faust Godot, I don't think it will get us to what we are wanting. And part of it, part of what we're wanting is accountability. We want that accountability. So money is being, is going to these groups, these organizations, these areas in our state. But do we have an outcome, a measurable outcome? So I'm just not sure that we're there yet, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator Baumgartner. Senator Stephan. Chairman, I, I agree completely. I, and as I read the, the bill, uh, and Jenna could comment on this if she if you would like her to, but is is this is a bill necessary for this to be accomplished? I don't I don't see in there where I don't understand why we have to have a bill to to accomplish the the, the process that this bill uh, wants to be accomplished. Jenna, would you mind? Clarifying that? Um, yes, Mr. Chair, there in um, General Meyer Revisor Statutes Office, there are not currently any requirements in statute that would prohibit the Department of Children and Families from ensuring that those providing um, their foster care or other services would um, have to implement these measures. This would just be a mandate that they would be required to. Do we have any further questions or comments? Senator Petty. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Jenna, is the, the mandate that they would have to or the man, mandate for reporting? Isn't that there's a reporting element in there that goes back to the legislature? Um, yes, Mr. Chair, Jenna Moy, Revisor Statutes Office. And there are sort of two um, different requirements. The first would be to develop a plan to implement these performance-based contracts. And then after that has, and let's see, that would be required to be done by um, July 1st, 2022. And then in 2023, they would have to provide both the governor and the legislature an update. And then the subsection C of this bill would um, require in more of that reporting requirement to the legislature. Do we have any further discussion on this bill? Okay. What is the pleasure of the committee? I'll make a motion that we pass out Senate Bill 12 favorably. We have a motion to pass out Senate Bill 12 favorably for passage. 
Do we have a second? Second by Senator Holscher. Any discussion on the motion? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. aye. Those opposed, nay. The no's have it. Uh, Senate Bill 12 does not pass out. Committee, thank you for your time. I uh, apologize we went a little bit late, but we had some very good um, discussion on some bills and amendments, and we will see these on the floor. And um, everybody have a great week, and we will see everybody on the floor all day next week. So looking forward to it. Safe travels home.